Today, I want to talk about uh, what I term the seal of the semiosphere, cognitive evolutionary theory of religion. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming here to listen to me. Let me first uh, explain the title of my paper, The Seal of the Semiosphere, to explain this term. Uh, I use the term semiosphere relatively loosely, not necessarily following Lotman. Uh, I use the word semiosphere as a fancy word for culture, which means it is a sphere of meaning, everything that has meaning for the person, or uh, as we can see later, for an organism. By the word seal, I mean seal of approval, um, not necessarily approving as uh, positive, but uh, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging of the, uh, the existence of the thing sealed. Yeah, so that's the meaning of uh, this term. And what I want to argue, or rather to explain, is that religion is the seal of the semiosphere. That is, religion is an institution that confirms the culture, that acknowledges the semiosphere. The process behind the phenomena of uh, religion is uh, the re realization, conceptualization, and externalization in the form of an institution that affirms the culture. Yeah? So realization that there is a culture, conceptualization, and externalization. And I will explain all of this. This whole process is typical for human cognition, and it is a cognitive basis on which all human culture um, exists. This means that religion is a cognitive as well as cultural phenomenon. Uh, there are a few details that make this my description innovative within the cognitive evolutionary study of religion. These details have to do with how I see the drive to create culture, with what I mean by conceptualization, and the place of verbalization within conceptualization, and with the types of culture created throughout the evolution of human culture. I will explain everything. This approach belongs within the cognitive science of religion and builds upon the work of, uh, that was done in this field, the cognitive and evolutionary science of religion, if you know uh, the term. The cognitive evolutionary approach to religion explains the ancient origin of religion in natural processes, such as uh, cognitive biases, like fear from snakes, uh, the drive to mimic, etc., the very basic uh, biological uh, um, processes, processes that we share with other animals and uh, surely with the common ancestor of us and the uh, other apes. However, uh, on top of these natural processes, once humans have begun to be organized in groups that are larger than natural, if I may use, if I may say this, this term can be criticized. Uh, we should be using sociological processes to explain the evolution of human institutions. This process is described uh, nicely in the relatively new book by uh, Turner, Mariansky, Peterson, uh, Klostega, Peterson, and Geertz, and I'm building on what they described. The book talks about the evolution of religion, moving from the biological to the sociological. Cognitive issues are mostly discussed in, in, in this book uh, with regard to the biological evolution. When sociological processes begin to be more important, there is less emphasis on the cognitive processes in this book. Yeah? So they move into Durkheim and, 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 and Marxist explanations, etc., uh, not so much the cognitive ones. But what I'm missing in, in this book and in, in a lot of uh, books of similar uh, uh, topic, and this is what I want to supplement here, is the transition from the biological to the sociological. And this transition cannot uh, be uh, explained by sociological terms, at least not only, because if it does, then it is teleological, right? And uh, we don't believe in teleology in evolutionary studies. Yeah? So we cannot explain something because it ended up being like something else. There must be a cognitive reason for creating culture. And culture is the unique human soci uh, sociological environment. Yeah? It's the human niche uh, culture is. 
So what I want to describe here uh, is the transition from the cognitive creation of culture to the creation of the institution religion. Theories which I will use is the decoupling theory, uh, the three cognitive stages of Merlin Donald, and the predictive coding uh, theory. Uh, what is the difference between the religion and culture? This is actually the main thing, you know, because we run into trouble when we try to, to say, is this phenomena religious or not? Um, so religion looks different in different cultures, sometimes so much so that we find it hard to say, is it religion or not? And, or what is common to religion? Think of the question, is Christmas tree a religious or cultural phenomenon? This is what I'm going to relate to as well in, in, in my theory, because it's part of the theory. We explain the difference between religions, which is Allah in one place and Vishnu in another, by saying that each, each religion is constructed using the cultural canon of the society where it is. This means that there is a hierarchy. Yeah, there's a hierarchy between the culture and the religion. Um, so first there is culture and on top of this, there is religion. But this does not explain uh, what is the difference between religion and culture. Right? It, it, it describes, but it doesn't explain so much. I will suggest here how we can organize the relationship between these two concepts, culture and religion. This is yeah. the explanation starts with the cognitive drive to create culture. Then the type of cultures, um, various cognitive uh, stages of, of, of the human race uh, create. Uh, and then to explain uh, the, uh, the, how uh, cognitively institutions are being created. So I suggest to change the angle from uh, of, uh, of looking at religion, not as um, a set of belief beliefs constructing an institution, but the idea of an institutionalized set of beliefs. Yeah, so there is a, a, an earlier uh, process, which is institu institutionalization, and it can be, be directed to various things. And one of these things is to be directed to culture. Uh, I think this makes my argument you know, where I'm going a little bit clearer, but still I will go the way. Slide three. Uh, the concept of decoupling as an aspect of human cognition was developed by Tubi and Cosmides. They contrast decoupling as a cognitive uh, process to naive realism. And decoupling in, uh, in cognition refers to the dissociation of the episodic memory where things are tagged as true. Yeah? What we encounter is what is happening from the semantic memory where such a tag does not exist. The tagging is part of the scope operators according to their system, which enables uh, human cognition to keep information in various levels of truth, thus uh, circumvent the naive realism in which most other organisms live. So they accept whatever is put in front of them, whether it's true or not. In everyday words, decoupling means that there is an independent access to the memory that is without a trigger, yeah, independent, without trigger, and this means that human cognition can recognize that uh, the perceived input that enters through the sensory system is different from the memory. Yeah? Because we can keep both the memory and the uh, new input at, at the same time. Based on this cognitive possibility of decoupling, Baron van Heusden uh, developed the decoupling theory about the creation of human culture. Uh, the starting point of uh, this is uh, the question of meaning. Something is meaningful for an organism if it triggers a reaction. And so uh, on each level, amoeba, cat, whatever, when there is, when something triggers a reaction, then it, in, according to this theory, it has meaning. This is the meaning that it mm -hmm. triggers a reaction. The reaction can vary from simply recognizing this, the something, you know, the, the input, uh, to a uh, motoric reaction such as running or picking a tool or whatever, uh, when not recognized, when something is not, an input is not recognized, then it has no meaning. But the decoupling ability of uh, human cognition enables a situation in which there is recognition of what the input is and also that it isn't that. Yeah, it isn't recognizing that something is very close to what we have in the memory, similar. Uh, to the semantic memory, similar enough to be recognized, but not 
identical to it. Yeah, you, just to recognize a difference. This is a very uh, unique possibility. I'm not saying that it's only human. We, we don't know about other animals, but anyway, it is a human possibility. Uh, so this is a type of dissonance, yeah, the difference between the input and the memory, and it requires a um, solution. Yeah, and the solution to this dissonance is human culture. This type of reaction depends on the type of cognition the hominid or modern homo sapiens uh, uh, has. This is where the decoupling theory joins with Merlin Donald stages of the evolution of human uh, cognitions, mimetic, mythic, and theoretic cognitive strategies, which I will explain in a moment, and the cultures that each of these create. But the special contribution of the, this decoupling theory uh, to the issue at hand is that this theory is rooted in the biology of the organism, yeah, the, the, um, the decoupling um, in, the, in the brain, uh, like other evolutionary theories, but it makes the drive to create meaning, uh, the semiotic drive, first of all, a drive, a biological drive, uh, so it's a natural process, and it moves from the biological to the semiotic. Yeah, so it makes exactly this transition, transition that we were looking for, uh, transition to the semiotic reality, uh, reality of the organism, to create the semiosphere as an act of itself, a natural human act, not teleological. And like other uh, evolutionary uh, things that we, we, we study, this the natural process is then being utilized for the adaptation of the human race. So creating, um, producing the human culture, which, which is the advantage because it, um, it creates the cooperation and there's a whole, uh, and all the discourse that goes on with this. And I will not go into it at the moment, a bit more uh, later. Uh, so what kind of um, semantic, uh, semiotic reality are we creating for ourselves depends on our type of cognition. And our type, I'm saying human race type of cognition, I'm not saying personal. Donald talks about the evolution of human cognition and the type of culture each cognitive stage creates, uh, created and creates. The stages ratchet one on the previous, so one does not disappear when the next one arrives. And that it also means that in the current human culture, we have all of them. Yeah? So it's not that they, uh, they um, get lost. The decoupling process described above, which is the process of constantly, uh, something that's constantly happening in human life, would tune into whatever cognitive uh, cultural stage or environment a person finds themselves. So the stages you see here in, the, uh, in this little uh, rectangular square, um, very shortly about the mimetic uh, type of uh, cognition and the culture that it creates. Mimetic cognition, cognitive strategy and culture is based on sensory and in introspective information, thus intentionally mimicking this information, so this type of information, and using the body as a tool. Uh, this culture is typified by the expression of uh, sensory information using the body, such as movement uh, production, dance, noise production, uh, music, and mutual movement, etc., as cooperation. Yeah, it's very, um, it's bodily. There's no language at this uh, stage. Uh, the next one, mythic cognition, organizes sets of mimetic cultural artifacts, such as dances, etc., in syn syntactical syntactic clusters. So this is behind this stage, mythic cognition, storing reality. Yeah, so the connection, connecting of each of these into a story eventually assigning auditory signs as syntactical markers, and this develops into language, as we all know, and language is the major tool of uh, mythic cognition. Uh, it is the cognition behind mythology, history, anything narrative. It interprets, interprets the current situation in light of the storied imagination, yeah, the stories that we have in the memory. Uh, the relevance of uh, the story results from personification. Yeah? Stories are always about people, even if they are talking chairs and tables. Yeah? It's the personification that makes it relevant and, and catchy for the human who is also a person. Everything becomes personified, uh, object, society, nature, etc. Stories are an excellent tool for increasing group uh, in-group in, uh, in cooperation, as we know. 
such um, uh, thus enlarges groups to the sides of imagined communities and communities that don't that only exist because of um, we uh, keep them in our memory and within this type of cognition uh, we also find the story itself and in this type of cognition we also find our personified holistic power the superhuman counterintuitive agent which is the way uh, cultural revolution of religion calls god uh, in our current religions the benevolent and uh, infinitive one or the hectic and capricious capricious gods um, of other religions <laughs> mesopotamians or um, greek so this is anyway mythical mission and um, the last stage, uh, which Donald talks about, is theoretic. The core of the next stage, theoretic cognition, is theorizing and categorizing information, organizing, organizing it under tags, diagrams, schemes, uh, etc. Each of which points to a long stretch of information. Yeah? So this type of uh, cognitive strategy is very economic for the memory as it requires to remember only a tiny tag in order to access a large chunk of information. Uh, this information is in many cases external to the brain. It's out there. It's engraved on artifacts. Um, the skill developed uh, by theoretical mission is, is this externalization of memory and writing is one of the, one of the um, well-known ones. The externalized memory does not require a recipient anymore now you externalize the memory you're not telling someone something like in mythic cognition you externalize it with, even without audience and without a recipient uh, and even the creator of the information may be absent eventually the information is stable sustainable and unchangeable outside of the human brain so if we look at human activities, yeah, if you would vaguely remember what these cognitions mean, if you look at human activities, let's say play, the activity would look different with each type of cognition and their perspective culture. Play would be mimetic. Uh, uh, mimetic play would be physical interaction, mimicking each other, um, each other's movement, voices, etc. cetera. Uh, in mythic cognition, we would find role playing. Yeah? Um, so the biographical self is, is taking on other biographies, the type of computer games that tell a story, uh, or even board games that have little stories uh, attached to them. Uh, a theoretic cognition type of play would be uh, categorizing. So uh, card games, solitaire, yeah, all the Black Sea, all the Red Sea, all the, uh, general card games are, are really um, very uh, theoretical. Similarly, religion would look different in each of these um, cognitive cultures, yeah, in these types of cognition. Religion is um, not something that was invented by mythic cognition, which is usually the way people see it. It existed and exists uh, in other types of uh, cultures. It looks more like ritual, nonverbal, in mimetic cognition. Um, and non-personified and uh, non-personal in the theoretic. And in, in the mythic religion, we have this, uh, the, the mythical mission, let's say, adds to the mimetic a story. Yeah, so first we have the, the dance, and then we, we start storing it, and then also the movement would change. But uh, this would be the mythical mission. In the, in, in the theoretic, I'll go back now to uh, the, the non-personal god is there, the theoretical, in the theoretical culture, like in philosophy. To just remember to what kind of trouble medieval philosopher went into trying to say that the personified God from the Bible is the non-personified God of philosophy. So it's uh, philosophy, it's, uh, it's science, and, uh, and the explanations are objective, yeah? so uh, they have nothing to do with it. All right, so Donald's cognitive stages explain the diversity of cultural and religious forms. Uh, for the final stage of my uh, theory, we are going into the predictive coding theory. The predictive coding approach to the work of the brain, in the predictive coding approach to the work of, of, of the brain, conceptualization, which is what is written there, is a cognitive process. 
it's not linguistic. Yeah? We usually tend to think of conceptualization as linguistic, but this is here, it's cognitive. The term concept refers to a summary made by the brain of a situation that has been perceived to be as a sen sensory and introspective systems enough times to create a thick neural connection. Yeah? It's, it's multisensory. Uh, the summary means that the uh, concept is less granulated than the original situation and there are fewer details to it. Yeah? So if you see 100 cats, you can extract from them what is the concept of a cat. Yeah? So which is something like this. Yeah? It's not this cat and it's not many others that you have seen, but it's being um, summarized, conceptualized. In the framework, framework of predictive brain, yeah, this, uh, this whole theory, these summaries, concepts, uh, are then activated as predictions to anticipate uh, something that is going to happen. For the purpose of this uh, presentation, the issue of prediction is less important. What is important uh, here is the ability of the brain to evoke concepts whenever there is a trigger, or as we learned with the coupling theory also, without a trigger. It can evoke these concepts. Concept is thus a cognitive, not a linguistic phenomenon. However, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is one of the new neuroscientists that work with this uh, theory, made the connection, as many of us would do, between the cognitive concept and human language. Humans create a word to point to a concept and can thus evoke a concept by saying the word. Assigning a word to a concept externalizes it, and it turns uh, the concept in, uh, the concept into a stable entity in the culture, in the in the social group. Once we assign a word to, let's say, friendliness, to a set of be uh, the, the word friendliness to a set of behaviors, it can become a cultural value. You know, we, now we have the idea of friendliness in in the culture. If we recognize that we have the concept of culture, which refers to the idea of semi our semiotic reality, our semi-sphere, we can create a, the word culture. And yeah, so this is where we come to the word culture, you know, not just the culture as uh, intuitive, but the word, and then create the social institution that is responsible for this culture. A social institution, which is the to-go place to learn the meaning that we are supposed to assign to various phenomena. What is the ritualistic reaction to various situations? What is the story that holds our social group together, etc.? In short, an institution that knows what the meaning of life is. And meaning, yeah, the word meaning is full of meaning now. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> All right, we are back to where we began. This is how religion is the seal of the semiosphere, the confirmation of the culture. It is the social institution that is responsible to assert what the culture is. Yeah, so um, we, we go to the, to, the, to the priest, we go to the rabbi, we go to these people to when nothing else gives us an answer. This way of looking at or, or, or the text or the Bible. <laughs> Uh, this way of looking at religion explains first the similarity between religion and culture, of course, and the secondary nature of religion, yeah, that it is the summary, the conceptualization of our culture. Uh, of course, the problem with institutions, this is already beyond, is that they don't change very easily. So while the culture changes, the institution still stays, and then it gives the meaning which is not relevant anymore, and then the whole process of Hermeneutic comes in, etc., and the, uh, a thousand years later, gay marriage is is accepted in church or in, even in, in, in not, not in halacha but in Jewish society. Yeah, so, but yeah, it gets there eventually. So, thank you very much for listening. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you.